here comes our first guest. Yes, yeah, so we are we are actually in business now. This is Dr. Martin Munt coming up. Yeah. Hello, Martin. Hello. Hopefully Sorry I'm about the <laughs> yeah. He knows Alex, you. He knows Alex will might Sorry. Alex might join us soon. Yeah. Yeah, no the the link come. Uh we've just been messaging each other behind the scenes. Great. Okay, so he's on his way, hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. But um, this is the first time in the whole history of Skeptics in the Hub that we've ever had a crash like that. Well, it's because you're dealing with the Isle of Wight. You know, it's probably, um, well, you know, it's a long way away. <laughs> well, we've, we've dealt with Tasmania before. Uh, oh, you know, it's a bit closer. <laughs> <laughs> a bit more up yeah. probably. Well, you, you see, what you're doing now is reminding me why I left the Isle of Wight. Because <laughs> it, it is the land of my birth. I am a genuine Isle of Wighter, but uh, I fled when I was 19 and I haven't really gone back much since. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we, we do have an audience and I think they're dropping off at the moment because we've been <laughs> boring. We're talking about the Isle of Wight. <laughs> yes, but the, the subject tonight is in fact paleontology, isn't it? Alex says he's not there for some reason. He's just uh, popped up on a message saying he's not there yet. For some okay. Reason. Well, we'll wait. You and I will have a chat while we wait. Is what anybody is... else there to say hello to? Yes, we've got four viewers. Four <laughs> viewers. <laughs> I think uh, we lost some when we when we crashed. Okay. Never mind. I'll introduce myself to the, to the viewers, shall I? Just introduce yourself a bit. Hello, hello, folks. Uh, obviously, I don't know who's there, but as, as has been said, I'm Martin Munt. I'm the curator and manager of Dinosaur Isle Museum on the Isle of Wight. Uh, been there for now about three, three and a half years. Before that, I was head of paintology collections at the Natural History Museum in London. And before that, I was on the Isle of Wight. So um, I've sort of moved my career between uh, the Isle of Wight and London um heaven knows why i'm back but i'm back um and uh the museum is is well the, the museum had originated from a series of museums that have been around for about 200 years um in various forms uh once at newport uh which is the main town on the isle of wight and then ultimately ending up in sandown where it arrived in about 1914 uh and uh has been in its new building since uh, 2001 uh, the Isle of Wight is uh, world famous essentially for its dinosaurs, but is one of the great one of the great bits of classic geological geology. Uh, sorry, let's start that again. Classical bits of geology in the UK. Um, the rocks on the Isle of Wight range in age from about 125 million years ago to about 30, 35 million years ago. So it's a time slice of between what's called the Cretaceous period which is the last period of the Mesozoic and uh, the earliest part of what we nowadays call the Paleogene in old money that was called the Cenozoic. Well, it's still called the Cenozoic, but in old money, it's, it's usually referred as the tertiary period. Um, thankfully, uh, most of the rocks on the Isle, well, all of the rocks that belong on the Isle of Wight are sedimentary, which means they've been laid down either by, uh, by water, some by air, um being blown um but uh, because the majority of them were laid down in shallow waters it means there's an awful lot of fossils preserved on the isle of wight now these are quite young geologically um you know because some you know life goes back what, about 1.2 billion years for viruses very much in in favor at the moment or not in favor depending on which way you're looking at it um and um you know multicellular life comes in at about ooh, about six seven hundred million years ago so um so the rocks on the other way are, are geologically quite young if that helps you understand a little bit about the geology of the isle of way i can go into more detail if you need anybody got any questions arising from that we will look at questions in a minute because there, there are some viewers who will be putting up there comments and their questions but at this point i like to remind okay. them that if they have a question to ask can they put a cue in front of it so that we can distinguish it from their ordinary comments so i'm going to put that reminder on the screen 
now. There you go. So I'm going to find that point that you talked about. Oh right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's got dark, just like you predicted. It's got dark. So I think that's the printer that can be turned off, and this light can be plugged in its place. And let's see if it will work. Yay! Oh, blooming heck. You will answer the questions. <laughs> this Conservative Party head headquarters. Right. <laughs> there you go. Is that better? That's fine. Yeah. That's better, isn't it? Very, very handsome. Yep. yep. Right. So, <laughs> so the, the, the Kimmeridge clay stratum doesn't extend to the Isle of Wight, does it? Well, it will be down below the surface on the Isle of Wight. Um, yeah. It's no uh, late, sort of early, late, we'd call it early, late Jurassic. It sounds a bit contradictory, that, but uh, that's the way we've referred to it. Kimbridge Clay, um, as as in the name, is exposed at Kimbridge in the Kimbridge area in Dorset. Mm. Uh, it's also exposures of Kimbridge Clay in York, on the Yorkshire coast, and there are some natural equivalents in Scotland. Um, the Kimbridge clay itself is not at the surface of the island, it's way down below the ground. Right. Uh, it, it may be, um, well, it's certainly be underneath where I am here in Cowes on the Isle of Wight, but to say it's many, 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 many meters down below the ground. I mean, I, I, I living on what's known as the, the Hampstead member, which is, um, it's very late Eocene, which is obviously a lot younger so down below me here is a pile of sediments which um, includes all of those uh, all of the tertiary rocks the Cenozoic rocks and then uh, then you've got about a, a, a mile of thickness of chalk so that gives you an indication it's probably about two maybe as much as two miles below me so uh, yeah a mile yeah it, it's certainly that that it would certainly be that kind of depth below us it's it's way down in the ground by that here that was a lot of seashells. Yes, <laughs> a lot of mud. Well, obviously, you know, when you see rocks on the surface, they are invariably compressed. Uh, you know, and rocks below the ground are, are compressed, and mm. they only they reflect. Well, in part, they reflect how much sediment was deposited, uh, but obviously, then there's compaction of those sediments. So, you know, the sediment pole would have been originally been much thicker, but the compression due to earth movements have squashed them down a bit. Mm. Yeah. So, if you want to see the Kimbridge, you go to Kimbridge. In short, you go to the Etches Collection in Kimbridge and see these wonderful. Um, I have a bit of an advert here. I um, I'm there curator advisor so it's a bit of an, a bit of an advert uh -huh. for, the Kimbridge, for the Kimbridge Museum going on there but it's an excellent excellent collection the etches collection at Kimbridge and then yeah, you can go down to the beach for, for the benefit of our viewers who may not have uh, done much geology or paleontology can we just go through what we what we're talking about here you've obviously indicated that this is a great age we're discussing isn't it this is yeah. From a time before history was being recorded. Yes, long, this, long. This yeah. is what's called deep time, isn't it? Yes, we, 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 gen we generally, uh, probably for the last 20 years, we've been referring to it as deep time um, because it really is deep time. You know, we're, we're talking millions of years here. Um, mm. You know, if you go to very, very ancient rocks, you're talking billions of years. Yes. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, first, uh, first people that look like you and I, we're probably running around about, uh, ooh, it's not really my field, but probably about a, certainly a hundred thousand years ago, uh, you'd seen human, human like an, human animals, they would look oh. very much like us. Mm. Uh, but, you know, for, for our lineage of hominids, um, it's not, say, apologies, it's not really my fault, but a hominid, you're, you're, you're looking no more than a, you know, a few hundred thousands of years yes. uh, to about a million years um million years plus so we are now talk with but for for what we're talking about we're jumping back into the millions of years you know sort of youngest rocks below me here be about 35 million years so yes. a huge period of time and history history is the beginning of writing isn't it and writing and recording things so you look you look to the classical the classical uh, um cities of ancient greece and uh Egypt and their curses, uh, who you know, invented writing, people like the Sumerians. So you're talking thousands of years, uh, only thousands of years. Yes. Okay. 
a mere drop in the ocean over time. I've delayed the second in the second. Yeah. I can see my... I'm doing the match green bit again. Yes, we have a... We have a, a dodgy connection again, don't we? Yes, and Alex hasn't appeared yet. But we are expecting Alex to come yeah, along, hopefully. It's gone, it's gone crappy again. So there are three types of rock. There's igneous rocks, which were liquid at one stage and solidified as the earth cooled. And, and some of them have subsequently melted and come out of volcanoes. But there's also sedimentary rocks, which were formed by the erosion, the wearing away of the igneous rocks by water and wind, and then washed by rivers and rain down into the sea or lakes where they settled and sedimented in layers with the oldest ones at the bottom. It's a bit like your emails where you've got the oldest ones at the bottom and the newest ones at the top. So we can tell the age of a rock by its position in the sequence or roughly. And then there's metamorphic rocks, which are sedimentary rocks that have been cooked by a volcano or something. So chalk turns into marble thanks to heat. And the, the ones which are rich in fossils, and this is about paleontology, so that's the, the ones we're interested in, are the sedimentary rocks, because they were formed in water for the most part, and as, as animals died, their hard parts settled to the bottom of the sea where they gradually petrified, fossilized, turned into rock. And I see we've got Alex here, so I'm going to bring him on screen. Hello, Alex. Hello. Sorry, I'm here now. <laughs> Great. Nice to see you. We've had some technical problems tonight, which is unusual. We haven't had those before, but we do seem to have a strong connection with you now. Brilliant. So this is, would you like to introduce yourself a bit to the to viewers? Okay, hello, I am Alex. I work alongside Martin at Dinosaur Isle Museum. I work primarily with education and outreach at the museum, but also deal with some field work and I do a bit of the documentation as well. Great. So I believe you've got a bit of a presentation for us. Yes, I can throw up some slides. Great. Have a look. Okay, let's let's do that. I'm going to disappear and leave you to fill the screen with your slides and your information. There's your slide. Fantastic. We've got some viewers who are commenting, and later on in the show, I will put forward some of the comments that they have they have come up with. Okay. Okay. Over to you for the moment. Brilliant. So sorry, I I don't know where you've been so far in this. So I'll start from where I where i was going to but if you have any thoughts if there's anything that i'm covering again then please do just stop me and we'll go from there so something that we've got up at the moment is a geological map of the Isle of Wight. so if you're not already been told dinosaur isle is a museum based in sandown on the island and the Isle of Wight is a fantastic place for geology and paleontology it's got this really uh, unique system of rocks that we don't see in many other places and that, that's really important so if we go back to ab about 300 million years we start to see the early formation of the atlantic ocean as that's opening up this is a big crack in the earth's surface that is spreading out from the uh well spreading out east to west and forming that ocean between us and America. As it does that, it forms a lot of east-west trending cracks. These cracks are effectively what has formed the, well, we'd say the English Channel. It's formed a lot of the downs, the hills that we see on the Isle of Wight, in southern England, all the way up beyond uh, London, up to Bedfordshire, in northern France as well. All of this relies on this these deep down seated faults which have been moving on and off over the last 300 million years so rocks typically form in horizontal layers with the oldest rocks at the bottom and the youngest rocks at the top that's what usually happens we then 
do occasionally have diachronous rocks where similar rocks of different ages it all gets confusing they start to form because of uh sea level variants but rocks generally form in horizontal layers and that is what started to happen on the island about 125 million years ago and this is when we start seeing dinosaurs living on the island but because of these faults that are seated deep down underneath the island reactivating moving up and down we start to see these what were horizontally layered rocks start fold up and down and this is what forms our current topography so on the isle of wight a common rock is the chalk we see it in the very southern part of the island and we see it in the central part of the island on the map that i'm showing you it is the dark green and bright green that you can see through the middle and then right at the very southern part of the island then you think you have chalk in and around portsmouth all the way along to dover then you have chalk to the south of london you have chalk to the north of london all of this is essentially the same chalk that forms between 170 million years ago but because of all these east west trending faults that are underneath the isle of wight underneath southern england the chalk that was in these horizontal layers starts to be bent up and down up and down it forms the topography that we have today and exposes the rocks that we have around us as well so i went into a long rant about geology there because it's quite important to what rocks are actually exposed on the surface of the isle of wight because if it wasn't for all of those faults and these folds forming we wouldn't see these very very old rocks exposed on the surface we'd only see the most recent rocks that have formed so if you have a look at the map you can see in the southern part of the island particularly along the southwestern part you've got quite a aquamarine blue color and you've got exactly the same blue color on the eastern side of the island as well this is the wessex formation this is the oldest rock that we see exposed on the isle of wight it's about 125 million years old this is the rock that the dinosaurs come from as you go both north and south from that the rocks start to get progressively younger and we start to see a marine transgression this is where because of a combination of basin depression so land level becoming relatively lower and because of relative sea level rise seas start to encroach on the land so slowly over a very long period of time over about 25 million years deep seas start to form over the island that carries on for quite a long time so we're saying the wessex formation these old rocks that contain the dinosaurs are about 125 million years old and they get younger and younger as you go through and then we start seeing these deep seas form about 100 million years ago that carries on until about 70 million years ago at this point these faults that are deep down underneath the isle of wight start to reactivate it starts to lift the chalks that had formed up out of the seas they start to erode down they start to fold over and it starts to form the basics of the islands and well southeast england's topography at this point we start to see younger rocks form up against a fold through the middle of the island so the northern part of the island where we've got these much lighter colors light blue and light purple we start to see a basin and shallow sea form and this forms rocks that are about 40 million years old these are very very important for more recent fossils but we can get into that so that's the basics of geology of the island then if we get into the paleontology of the island the isle of wight has been studied for geology and paleontology for the last 200 years it's one of the first places that people started to study the basics of geology and paleontology and it's well known for many many different things in terms of fossils what i should say is there's a huge because of that geology that we have this big range in geology because we have something like 60 million years of rock exposed around the coast of the Isle of Wight 
we have an awful lot of different types of fossils. Within the collection at Dinosaur Isle, we have something like two and a half thousand different fossil species, all found on the Isle of Wight. That is a huge amount for such a small area. We have something like 65 miles of coastline, and we have two and a half thousand different fossil species found there, just in our collection alone. There will be a lot of other species that we don't necessarily have present in other collections as well. So the island has got a huge diversity of different fossils, but it's probably best known for dinosaurs. And one of the biggest reasons for that is the fossil that I'm showing you at this very moment. This is an etching of the sacrum of an iguandon. So the sacrum are the vertebrae that are within the pelvic girdle. The sacrum is very important because you think certainly in humans, a huge amount of weight goes through your sacrum. Your pelvis attaches to your sacrum. So all of your weight is being dispersed through it. And so it needs to be very, very strong. And what that means is that the vertebrae within your sacrum, within that pelvic girdle, rather than being separated by discs of cartilage like they are in the rest of your body, they fuse together to form one solid bone. And that is what we call the sacrum. Now, why is this so important to dinosaurs? One of the first characteristics that was recognized that separates out dinosaurs from all other extinct and extant reptiles is the sacrum and the number of vertebrae that are fused together in that one solid bone. A gentleman called Richard Owen, who is a very important dinosaur researcher, he's one of the first paleontologists, particularly working on dinosaurs. He's the founder of the Natural History Museum. He recognized this trait. He recognized that dinosaurs have at least five vertebrae fused together in their sacrum. And at the time, all cold-blooded animals that are both living and extinct had a maximum of two. Now, this character that we see here, the five fused vertebrae, isn't just restricted to dinosaurs. Humans also have five fused vertebrae. So when dinosaurs were categorized, when we're saying what a dinosaur is, we used many other features. But one of them was the fact that dinosaurs must have at least five vertebrae fused together in their sacrum. And the fossil that uh, Richard Owen... Alex, can you put that slide on screen? We're, we're stuck on the whole geology of the Isle of Wight at the moment. Can you... Has it... uh, I did change it a while back. Hopefully, um, has yep, it changed now? It. Yep, we got it now. Thank you. Brilliant. Sorry. OK, so hopefully you can see that better now. So if I just describe it, running through the central portion of the screen from the top to the bottom, you have the sacral vertebrae. And then to either side of that, you have the ilia, the top portion of the pelvis. Now, <clears throat> as, as I was saying, this isn't the only classification that we have for dinosaurs. There are many other features that we use to define what a dinosaur actually is. But this is one of the first features that we used. And this is really important to Yard of White because when Richard Owen was saying this, when he was saying a dinosaur has to have at least five vertebrae fused together in the pelvis, he had to have something to show that. He can't just say that's what a dinosaur is. He has to have an actual fossil that shows that to prove that it is true. And so what he uses is an Iguandon sacrum found at Hanover Point, which is on the southwest coast of the Isle of Wight, to show that. So when we're talking about dinosaurs, you are, in actual fact, talking about three skeletons. You're talking about the skeleton, the sacrum of this Iguandon found on the Isle of Wight. You're talking about the skeleton of a Hylaeosaurus found in Hastings, a big armoured dinosaur that was found in Hastings. And we're talking about a Megalosaurus, a large predatory dinosaur that was found in Oxford. Because when Richard Owen created the word dinosaur, as I said, he had to have actual fossils that show all of these traits that he was talking about. 
and one of those fossils, one of those three dinosaurs, was from the Isle of Wight. Now, things have changed a bit since then. Hopefully, my slide will change with this. So let me know if you don't see a changed slide. Uh, da, da, da. Hopefully, that's come through. Hopefully, now, you should be seeing the image of something called Mantellosaurus. This is a mid-sized plant-eating dinosaur found on the Isle of Wight, described from the Isle of Wight. That is the actual holotype of it. So that is, when we talk about Mantellosaurus, that is the actual one. That is the first one that we describe it. Now, that Iguandon sacrum that I was talking about a second ago that I showed you that illustration of, now that is known to be Mantellosaurus. But at the time, it's referred to as Iguandon. The main point is, though, that doesn't really matter which dinosaur it was. The main point is that that is effectively one of the first three dinosaurs. Or you could even argue it is the dinosaur, because the word dinosaur comes from that exact fossil found on the Isle of Wight. So that, that is a very important message I think everyone should take home, is that the word dinosaur, in part, comes from a fossil found on the Isle of Wight. It also comes from these two other fossils found in Hastings and Oxford. But it just goes to show you how important the Isle of Wight is for dinosaurs. Has Martin spoken to you so far? I've heard Martin. He was, spoke to me before you came on, Alex. Okay. And we'll, we'll engage him again later when we do the okay. questions, the Q&A. Okay, fantastic. Okay. I'll just scroll through slides. So something I was talking about earlier, uh, I, I've studied a lot of the historical side of paleontology and so hopefully you should have a new image here <coughs> these are things called osteoderms these are plates of bone that are not part of the main skeleton they are growths of bone that form in the upper layers of the skin these are quite common today in crocodiles and they form a big series of bones, a series of flat plates in the upper part of the back, underneath the belly as well, and they act as protection. These osteoderms, these pieces of bone that grew in the skin, are actually from a dinosaur called Polycanthus. This is a large armoured dinosaur. Um, picture it as uh, the good comparison, we say, we call it the dinosaur tank because it is incredibly well built, incredibly stocky, very low to the ground. It would have been quadrupedal, so spending the majority of its time on all four limbs. It had small flat plates of bone like this embedded into the upper part of its back and down its tail. Over its shoulders, it had incredibly large spines. And over its hindquarters, over its pelvic girdle, it had a big flat plate of bone almost like that of a turtle shell. And in fact, when Polycanthus was first found on the Isle of Wight, when the type specimen was found, the gentleman that found it thought it was a turtle because it had that similarity. It was this big sheet of bone that formed over the top of the pelvis. Now, what's important about these osteoderms? These are potentially the oldest fossils that we can trace in the collection of Dinosaur Isle. Dinosaur Isle, as it is, was opened in 2001, but the collection is much, much older than that. The collection was founded sometime in between 1810 and 1820, and it was founded in Newport Philosophical Society. Fossils were collected for a long period of time, but they weren't very well documented. These particular pieces of armour we know were in the museum at least in 1852, potentially earlier. So historically, they are very important because these are some of the first bones that would have been found on the Isle of Wight. They are some of the first pieces of this dinosaur that would have been studied on the island. It is quite likely that these bones were being looked at by the likes of Gideon Mantell, one of the early dinosaur researchers, by Samuel Beckles, by Richard Owen. All of these people were quite likely looking at these fossils whilst they're in the museum. 
So that's just a nice little historical piece. So this is one of my favorite fossils within our collection at the museum. Um, Martin's going to be laughing at this because I found it. That's why it's one of my favorite bones. This is the upper arm bone, the humerus of a marine reptile, a plesiosaur. The plesiosaurs were, the best way of describing them is they're kind of like a cross between a crocodile and a dolphin, except they had a very long neck, you know, kind of like long neck, the Loch Ness Monster. Plesiosaurs are incredibly rare on the Isle of Wight. We don't find many of their remains. We do have in the collection a couple of partial skeletons, but they're still quite rare. And that makes this one of the one of my favourite fossils that I've found. This is something that I have given to the museum, obligated to in all honesty. But it it's it's a spectacular thing for me. Now this this is important to me because normally everyone comes to the island for dinosaurs. We're we're really well known for dinosaurs. And what I always want to advertise is there are more things than just dinosaurs on the Isle of Wight. You could also say there are more things than just vertebrates. We do have invertebrates as well, which are equally as interesting. I personally quite like the Cretaceous vertebrates, but there are many, many other things you can study here. So this is a small example of that. I think something that we should think is that go back to that two and a half thousand different fossil species found on the island. There are just so many different things found here. If you go to the north coast of the Isle of Wight, where you have these younger sediments, these rocks that are I think, between about 40 and 50 million years old and formed in environments ranging from swampy environments, kind of like the Everglades through to shallow shores, these rocks show something called the Grand Coupre. And this is where we see a big changeover in mammals, in the mammal diversity that we see over the planet. We, in a very short period of time, we start to see this big in from very basal, very archaic forms of mammal, the kind of mammal that you would expect to have lived alongside a dinosaur then very rapidly they start to branch out and evolve into early forms of the diverse mammals that we see today so the island actually shows this this big turnover and what we start to see are things like very early horses early camels early rhinoceroses have been found on the other right, early pigs. There are so many different things here, even early dogs, early cats, early primates. So many of the current mammalian form that we have here start to be shown on the island. So th this big diversity that you see here is partly what makes the island so important. So it might be a good opportunity to take a couple of questions if you have any. Yeah, sure. We'll bring up some questions now. We have got some. And uh, one of them is coming up right now. Can you read that? Yep. How do we know these osteoderms are actually fossils? <laughs> okay. So I'm going to bring Martin back. See if he wants to have a go at some of these two. There he is. Hello, Martin. We're doing the questions. Hello. Uh, I, th I think he's still got connectivity problems. Perhaps I'll take him down for the moment. Alex, uh, it's you and I. Okay, that's fine. So, in terms of the osteoderms, really, it's we know what that they are fossils for exactly the same reason that we know anything today is a fossil. It is by making direct comparisons with living things and seeing the similarities. So, when we look at these osteoderms, when you look at the very fine detail, you will see trabeculae in there. You'll see very fine pores which are on the inside of the bone which is where the bone marrow is formed so hopefully i might be able to show you uh, let's see if this works on our camera so you can see structure that you wouldn't find in an ordinary rock no so i i don't know if you can see this very well this is a series of 
three vertebrae yeah, that yeah. came from, in this case, I bought it from Lime Regis. I haven't found this one myself. And when you look very closely, you might see this fine detail structure running through the vertebrae. So the vertebrae themselves are these three spool-like structures running mm -hmm. down through there. And then very closely, you might just be able to see lots of fine spots. Those spots are the trabeculate, the holes on the inside of the bone where the bone marrow is formed. Now, this is a very distinctive patination that would be highly unlikely to have formed through some random occurrence. Then when you apply that to the bones that we find, you think they've got trabeculate. They've got this fine honeycomb pattern running through them. They have got similar shapes to bones that we have in the skeletons of other living animals. All of these similarities allow us to recognize them. Mm. So with all fossils, not just these osteoderms, the important thing to take back is it's by comparing them to living things today and looking at all of the similarities. So that is how the earliest paleontologists recognized what fossils were. If you go back about 4,000 years, the ancient Greeks recognized seashells that had been turned into stone. But at the time, they didn't actually know how to explain them. Yeah. They recognized that these were seashells. They recognized that they were high up on land where there weren't any seas. But they, couldn't, they didn't have a good enough understanding of geological processes mm. to say how these things had formed. Now, it's quite possibly this is why we have the mythology of something like Medusa. This lady that would turn you into stone if you were to look into her eyes, it might be how they explained fossils at the time. Uh -oh. I, it's, it's a possible. I'm not saying that is definitely how it happened. But the point is that 4,000 years ago, without an understanding of geological processes and without the ability to date rocks to tell the age of them, the ancient Greeks were recognizing fossils by this yeah. simple comparison of looking at living things today and seeing how they're similar. So if I pull out another thing here, okay, um, there we go. So uh, Austria. hopefully you can recognize that. Is that Austria? Nope. This is from Brackersham Bay, just south of Chichester. Uh, Glyphia. Glyphia. No, no. Glyphia is an oyster. So what you'd see is one rounded shell and then one flat shell underneath uh. it. This yeah. one has symmetry, it has mirror symmetry. So yeah. this is a clam. Um, I think the current name is Venerocardia. Martin would correct me on that one. Um, I'm not too hot on the invertebrates. But hopefully, it's fairly obvious as to what it is. I think I might have glued this together now. You can see that as a clam shell. But this has come from rock. That yeah. is how we recognize fossils. It's turned into rock. It's petrified. Oh, um, petrified is a very specific term. Petrified is a term that you'd use specifically for plant material that has been replaced by silica. Oh. So it is a specific type of fossilization. Uh -huh. There are many different types of fossilization. The uh -huh. main thing that they all have in common. So when I define fossils, I say they have to be three things. They have to have changed in some way. So the minerals that are made of will have changed in some way. They have to be evidence of something that was living. And finally, they have to be at least 10,000 years old. Usually we say that for something to be a fossil, to kind of separate it out from archaeology, modern social history, we say they have to have come from at least 10,000 years ago, before the written word, roughly. Uh -huh. um, now, when I'm saying about fossils have to have changed in some way, the way that they have changed and what they have been replaced by can be very varied. You could have body fossils where the initial fossil has been replaced by a new mineral. So like with the ichthyosaur vertebrae that I showed you earlier, the bone has been replaced by a new mineral. Mm -hmm. You could have a form of infill. So for example, here I have a nice little ammonite. In this case, there is none of the original animal left at all. What we have is rock that has formed on the inside of the shell. The shell itself has been dissolved away. So you're just left with an internal mold. So 
this is a still it is a body fossil because it's showing evidence of the original animal but mm -hmm. to a certain extent it is also a trace fossil because it's not actually part of that living creature at all so, so what, uh, what, what, what's a cast then what will be a what what form of fossil would be a cast that's where so it's it's a hole left in the rock where the fossil used to be that's filled up with some other originally liquid rock material that's crystallized so that that hammerlite that i just showed you could have been a good example of a cast because it is uh, the internal mold uh -huh. of the shell it is a reflection of the shape of the inside of the shell the actual shell is no longer there one of the more common cast forms of fossils that we find on the island are the dinosaur footprints uh -huh. where dinosaurs were walking walking through what were soft sediments that eventually lift thigh and turn in stone to retain the original shape of the footprint. Uh, those are two very good examples of cast fossils, I think. Mm. Yeah, so one of the problems we're up against here, I think, is that people who have not had much of a scientific education don't know that bone has structure. Yeah. They think of it as sort of rock itself. So they don't realize that it's got an inside with shapes and you know formations that are very unlike rock yes. and are only found in living creatures so I mean, something that's very important to remember that is you think if you break a bone it can heal that shows that it is living material your bone is constantly growing actually mm. uh, from what i remember it on average roughly over a period of about seven years the minerals of your bone will have been fully replaced. So the bones that you have inside of you now are not the same bone that you're born with. The material that they're made of has been replaced because it's living mineral, living cells are creating and depositing that mineral that is the actual solid part of the bone. And the cells that are there are not preserved themselves, but the shape that they took, the form that they created will still be preserved in the fossil. So I've had about 10 skeletons so far. <laughs> yeah, I can comment on that but roughly every seven years. Whoops, what a giveaway. So what about this question here? Do these five fused vertebrae appear in both lizard-hipped and bird-hipped dinosaurs? Now, the bird-hips are the later branch of the dinosaurs, are they? Uh, so... the. <sighs> This was an older classification that for, for some people has changed. So uh, we're talking about this way that we, we define fossil when I was saying that we make comparisons, we look at rocks, we look at living things today and we see similarities. That is how you'd also define living creatures as well. You look at the similarities that each other, that each living thing has with each other so we talk about how humans are related to other apes because of these similarities and when you look at myself you might see similarities with a gorilla there are those similarities there um i am a mammal i have similarities with a cat with a dog with, with any other mammal i am also a vertebrate so i have a backbone just like a dinosaur i'm more closely related to a dinosaur than i am to worms so we look at all these ways of grouping living and extinct creatures and one of the ways that we used to group dinosaurs is by the structure of their hips some dinosaurs have a structure that is more common to birds some dinosaurs have structure that is more common to lizards it's not easy to describe that in all honesty without pulling up a few pictures um but to, to answer the question it, it is a common feature to all dinosaurs great regardless of their actual pelvic girdle they have i should say at least five fused vertebrae it can be more right the main point when uh, richard Ohm was defining this is that they have to have at least five possibly more wow. we are talking about dinosaurs potentially being quite small some dinosaurs would have been the size of a crow or a magpie mm -hmm. some dinosaurs we have got good fairly complete skeletons that are about 40 meters in length. So you're talking about tens of tons of weight. That mm. weight is going all the way through their hips. They have to have something there that is going to support that. 
So sometimes they did have more fused vertebrae in there. And wow. certainly in some of the older dinosaurs, some of their lumbar or even tail vertebrae start mm -hmm. to fuse onto that sacrum as well, which gives it even more strength as they yeah. get older. <laughs> so we are, we are yes. talking about something like a London bus here, aren't we? Being, being supported <laughs> on a few bones. Yeah, effectively, it, it's uh, when you think about when we're standing upright, the majority of our weight is being transferred through our pelvis. Mm. And so yeah. it has to be very, very strong bone. It's it's something that we can use. The, the, the way a bone is built is very useful for us into identifying what the bone is. So actually, our vertebrae, our backbones, relatively to the rest of our skeleton, don't bear that much weight. So our vertebrae have got most of this trabecular bone, this spongy bone. That is where the bone marrow is formed. Our limb bones and our pelvic girdle take the most of our weight particularly our leg bones, all of your weight is going through your legs. So they have got much more cancellous bone, this thick, dense outer wall to the bone, which mm. makes it strong. So if you were to section your leg bone right now, you would see that it's got a very solid, dense outer part and actually a bit of a canal running through the middle of it, a bit of an open area, which makes it a bit lighter. That's right. If you were to section a vertebra, you'd see lots and lots of this spongy bone on the inside of it because our bones vary depending on the function, what they're doing, because of basic things like how our body is transferring weight. Yes. And dinosaur skeletons did exactly the same thing as well. Yeah, think of a leg of lamb, for those of you who are not uh, vegans, and uh, you will see the outer thickness of, like a pipe, to, to give a resistance to bending, which is what you need for a leg. You, you have admirably illustrated the point that Classification and nomenclature is a human fabrication. We have put these things into groups for our convenience. They weren't presented to us with these names in a fait accompli. A lot of people don't understand that. No. That, that is a very important factor for me when we are talking about evolution and whether it is something that did or didn't happen. I, that actual nomenclature of how we separate out living and extinct things, it is, it is just a fabrication. It's something that we use ourselves to help define these things. Mm. And so evolution, it, it, whether it did or didn't happen, it, it's entirely reliant on us actually classifying these things in the first place and saying, yes, they are different things. If you... If you start changing that, if you start playing with it, which we do because we are constantly reevaluating how things are related, um, what they actually are, then it messes with the whole system. And to me, that is that when, when people say that there's no evidence of evolution, I'd say the, the only reason you can say that is because of how we classify thing, living things today, how we put them in these different groups. It, it It's just our need to classify things it's it's just that human nature to need to do this we want understandable patterns yes. so have you ever found a bunny skeleton in the cretaceous alex <laughs> no well there you go if you did that would falsify evolution so uh, something that we we're talking about earlier is the concept of uh, a conversation i had with john anyway was about how we age fossils, how we tell how old they actually are. Mm. This is something that we've only actually been able to do in the last 50 or 60 years using radiometric dating. When the earlier paleontologists were working two or 300 years ago, they did not have the technology to do this. They used a very, very simple principle that makes total sense. They used relative ages. So they said, this rock is older than that rock. Firstly, based on the basis of continuity so rocks at the bottom are older than rocks at the top but also based on the actual fossils they're finding in there so they started to group up rocks based on the number of comparable species they have in the rocks to living things today so for example if a rock has uh, say 10 fossils in it and 80 percent of those fossils are still alive today that is a relatively young rock. Mm. 
if you find a rock that has 10 fossils in it and only 20 percent of those species are still alive today only two of them are still alive today that's older mm -hmm. because they have changed over a long period of time mm -hmm. and so although when paleontologists were first working they couldn't give you actual ages of these rocks they could give you relative ages uh, in very accurately actually they got it pretty yeah. much spot on for a very long time yeah. just by doing a simple process of looking at the number of similar species to what is alive today yeah and and of course that's when they discovered that there's been a progression starting from simple and ending up in complex broadly speaking i mean i know there's been some diversions on the way <laughs> but, but uh, you you can you can see how uh, sophistication has appeared over the geological time scale Yes, absolutely. So, uh, certainly, dinosaurs are a great example of that, and that is why Yard White is so important for the study of dinosaurs, is because we've got this fantastic period where you're going from very basic Jurassic dinosaurs to the very highly derived, highly evolved late Cretaceous forms, and we're kind of slap bang in the middle of that, and we start to see all these early changes. So, uh, a large predatory dinosaur that we find on the Yard of White near Veneta is somewhere in between the allosaurs the jurassic dinosaurs and the carcharodontosaurus the, the carcharodontosaurs sorry the late cretaceous dinosaurs it shares traits with both of them when we look at baryonyx an early spinosaur that we find on the isle of Wight, it shows traits of both spinosaurs and earlier earlier theropod dinosaurs that it we are seeing this evolutionary change and it, it goes back again to this whole concept of this human nature of needing to classify things. I, I don't know, uh, many of you have probably heard of Archaeopteryx. Mm -hmm. when, when I was at school, I was ta taught it is the oldest bird. It is the first bird. Then, just after I finished university, about nine years ago, it became a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Then, a couple of years later, it became a bird again. Yes. And now I, I think it's a dinosaur again at the moment. I, I can't remember what the consensus is on it. But yeah. there is this fossil, this Archaeopteryx, has got so many traits of the, both birds and dinosaurs. Yes. We can't say what it actually is. It is very hard to actually classify it. If that is not evolution, I don't know what is. Yeah. Well, when there... you can't classify it because it's got traits of everything. Yes. That's the in between here. That's the missing link that people yes. miss. Well, it, it, there's a school of thought, isn't there, that suggests that the birds existing today really ought to be called dinosaurs. Yes, absolutely. There is very good evidence that birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. Mm. There has been work done where we started using proteins to turn off the coding within bird embryos that tells them to grow into birds. We started trying to say, don't grow into a bird. Mm -hmm. What we have managed to do is started to form embryos that have got bird-like features, but they have also got bony jaws with teeth. Yeah. So by telling them don't grow into a bird, yeah. they are starting to grow these other features. Yeah. Where do they have these genetics from? They've got beaks with teeth in them. Yes. There you go. How, uh, why would they have that? It, it's, uh, it's it's all these questions. Uh, very confusing. It, it's because they share the DNA. I, I, <laughs> that, that, I would believe that myself, yes. It's an obvious explanation, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, Steve Cerny is asking us here, we talked about the rocks folding, didn't we? Yes. And he says, does that not destroy the fossils? Well, of course, my thought to that would be, if you've got a mile depth of rock, it might fold, but there's going to be a lot in the middle that doesn't really get crushed. Oh, it is very common to find heavily distorted fossils. Absolutely. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, so many of the fossils that we find on in the chalk of the Isle of Wight, which is the rock that shows the most uh, deformation, the most bending, the fossils themselves are deformed just as the rock would have been as well. Right. So absolutely. It, it, I wouldn't say it destroys them, but it does deform them. Uh -huh. And uh, the formation of metamorphic rocks, so where sedimentary oh. rocks have been exposed to high heat or high pressure, that yeah. is where you can potentially destroy fossils. Yeah. That is where fossils can be completely broken down. So it absolutely, it can 
it can distort fossils it can break them down as well yes but you do get some examples of marble that have fossil in yes absolutely yes it all depends on how it's formed how much pressure it's been exposed to how much heat it's been exposed to when it was exposed to these things yes um one of our skeletons we have a dinosaur uh, called mantellosaurus a very complete skeleton of this within the museum uh -huh. along the neural spines so along the top part of the vertebra the bits where if you look at someone you could see all those little lumps yep. in the middle of their back those are neural spines along the neural spines of this mantellosaurus there was a good part of a tree trunk and it was just smashed all oh. those spines yeah. the trunk is still on top of it and the yeah. bones are all broken over the top of it so yeah. absolutely these processes will destroy fossils they will break them and destroy them we are just very very lucky that they have formed well it's no wonder that fossils weren't discovered for hundreds of years it's because the chances of them surviving all the processes that they've been through over millions of years are fairly remote absolutely i think if we compare the number of species of extinct to extant so number of species alive right its very second compared to the number of species that we have found in the fossil record there is more than a hundred times as many species alive right at its very moment than what we found in the fossil record yet but, the fossil record goes back for four billion years but that is how unlikely it is for something to become a fossil yes yes indeed over uh, not only uh, does it have to become a fossil but then it has to be found absolutely and there's an, another factor involved in that but yeah. is isn't it also true to say that about 90% of the species that have ever existed have become extinct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I love the concept of extinction, uh, I think, uh, and evolution. I think a lot of people don't quite grasp what we're talking about. Um, something I'm always asked is about extinctions. How come dinosaurs extinct, went extinct, but crocodiles didn't? Yes. So 65 million years ago, there is a large mass extinction. Something like 45% of all species became extinct. Yes. So nearly half of all life became extinct. All dinosaurs went extinct. Many other species went extinct as well. Only some made it through. Only some species of crocodile made it through that extinction. Many others went extinct as well. The diversity that we have today has formed through a later radiation, through its later evolution. Yeah. And it goes back to what I was talking about with these mammals and why the Isle of Wight is so important. It's that only two or three small groups of mammals made it through that extinction. Many, many, many went extinct at the same time as dinosaurs. But those few that made it through later evolved out into many branches. You so, oh. yes. Yeah. I, I always compare um, evolution and extinction to something like a christmas tree is how it goes out then in then out and in then out and in the yeah. the main point is that there is always one all the way down the middle that yeah. keeps on evolving keeps on changing yes. and that's the one that makes it through the common the same way someone came up with this really interesting concept that if you think i'm a male i have to have a mother who has to have had a mother who has to have had a mother yeah. for two hundred thousand years that humans have existed i have just ended a succession yes. of women yes for yes. the last two hundred thousand years it has to be woman 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 and then yes. me and i've just ended that and you're the survivor because you happen to fit your environment yes <laughs> that's, okay. a, that's a comparison that i use to evolution anyway and yes. extinctions well some uh, russ here wants to know whether fossils are found off the coast in the water and how easy is it to search there rather than on land? Yeah, absolutely. Fossils have been uh, washed in from out sea. We have got a partial ammonite that has been caught by a trawler that was dragging off the um, seabed out towards the lake, I believe. So, yes, they are picked up in that way. The reality is the visibility on the island isn't particularly great. It, we have tried snorkeling and diving and yeah. had no luck occasionally we will find fossils that are absolutely coated in modern growth things like bryzoans and worms that they're all living over the surface of it so these fossils have clearly been in the sea for a very very long time it's yeah. only recently they've been washed in so absolutely there will be many many fossils that 
have eroded out of the cliffs and washed onto the seabed. Then there will be the fossils that have formed from the seabed itself, because the rocks that form the seabed will be the same rocks that form the cliffs. As the cliffs erode back, they don't erode all the way down. You have the seabed made of the same rocks of the cliffs. So absolutely, fossils will be there as well. And occasionally, they will wash in. But there's very little practicality for actually finding these things in the deeper waters. Well, I know do some of the we do get many um, ichthyosaur vertebrae coming from around the Kimmeridge area. Trawlers pick them up, but on the island, doesn't really work. The water's too muddy. Yes. Yes. So uh, Diana is asking, what sort of facilities do you have on the Isle of Wight? Can you go and feel the fossils? And is there any anything online offered by the Dinosaur Museum? Yeah. So. Uh, for online, I'd recommend either going to our website, www.dinosaurisle.com. We have got many education packages available on there, or we are uploading a lot of information onto our Facebook page as well, facebook.com for slash dinosaurisle. If you go onto there, we have got many things on there. Um, we are very, very hands-on at Dinosaurisle. We usually run, I would say, thanks to coronavirus, <laughs> we're not doing it at the moment. Oh. But normally at this time of year, we would be running our uh, public field walks where you can join us going down to the beaches, having a look for fossils, seeing what you can find yourself, where someone like myself would take you down to the beach, show you and explain to you the geology of the area, give you an idea of what fossils look like, how we recognize them, where you would actually be able to find them on this beach and help you actually recognize them and go from there. Then in the museum, again, we are very similarly hands on. You're welcome to pick up some of the fossils, not all of them. Certainly some of our type specimens and the, the important displays you're not allowed to touch. But we do have fossils that you're welcome to pick up. You can ask us questions about them and go from there. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. Have a look at our website and our Facebook page and also consider visiting the museum because we are very hands on. And that is for adults and for children. Uh, Certainly on our field walks, I have taken children that are just a couple of years old and can't really string words together, but they can pick up rocks up to um, retired groups. So, yeah, go for it. Excellent. I'm going to try and contact Martin again to say goodbye, really. But, and I also put the links that you talked about to your Facebook page and your website, Dinosaur Isle, in the comments afterwards. Brilliant, thank you. If we can raise Martin. Martin, are you there? It's a very, very poor line. Yes. Well, I'm yeah. I'm sorry you couldn't join us. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but I am still here. We could hear you in, intermittently. You're breaking up, but if you can hear me. Hello. I'd like to thank both of you for a fantastic, fascinating show. That's all right. Yeah, I'm going to take Martin down because the connection is so poor. Alex, pass on our thanks to Martin. I will do. And also, thank you very much to all those watching and all those watching in future when you visit the podcast. So I am now going to play the outro music. Bye-bye, folks. Bye-bye.